And so for 35 years I've been a Christian, I've continued to challenge my conversion, if you will. You know, I continue to study biochemistry and, and see even more and more evidence for design. In fact, have worked hard to develop design arguments based on the latest advances in biochemistry as a way to formalize that intuition of design that I had. I could continue to study the original life question and seeing more and more intractable problems emerge, you know, over the, the 35 years that I've been investigating. Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Jana Harmon, and you're listening to Side B Stories, where we see how skeptics flip the record of their lives. Each podcast, we listen to someone who has once been a skeptic, but who became a Christian against all odds. We all have assumptions about reality, about the way things are in the world. Most of the time, we're pretty settled in our beliefs. We don't question them, especially if they seem to make sense to us. They seem true to us and to those around us. But what happens when those beliefs are challenged, when we are presented with new information? We're generally confronted with a couple of options. We can shut down any opposing viewpoint without consideration and listen to those only within our own camp and become more convinced in our own beliefs. Or we can become open to other ideas, take a closer look at the confounding issue at hand and look for the best explanation, the one that makes the most sense of what we're seeing or experiencing. But sometimes taking a closer look can be difficult. It can come with costs. We may need to reorient our own views in a way that seems a bit uncomfortable, that takes us in a direction we never anticipated. We all want to be intellectually honest, or at least think that we are, but that road can be both challenging and demanding, especially if we find that the truth leads us to situations or intellectual positions we thought we would never seriously consider, much less believe. As a brilliant scientist, biochemist, and author, Dr. Foz Rana valued objective truth. His intellectual curiosity, intellectual honesty, and openness led him beyond his naturalistic presumptions to go where the evidence led him, from skepticism to belief in a creator God as the best explanation for what we see in biology, in all of reality. I hope you'll come and join in to listen to his fascinating story, as well as his perspectives on whether and how science and belief can and do relate to each other. It should be interesting. Welcome to Side B Stories, Fuzz. It's so great to have you with me today. Jana, thank you for having me. Oh, wonderful. Before we get started into your story, I'd really love for the listeners to know a little bit about you. You're quite an accomplished, credentialed gentleman scientist. So talk to us a little bit about who you are in, in terms of the things that you've studied and, and where you are now in your professional life. Yeah, yeah. Well, I um, have a, a, a PhD in biochemistry, earned the, the PhD from Ohio University, and then Afterwards, did a, a postdoc at the University of Virginia and then another one at the University of Georgia. And so my area of specialization, if anybody cares, is cell membrane biochemistry and biophysics. And uh, after uh, my second postdoc, I uh, took a position in research and development uh, for a Fortune 500 company and worked there for nearly a decade uh, before joining Reasons to Believe uh, 23 years ago. And uh, uh, I am just uh, in the last uh, few weeks assuming the role of president and CEO at Reasons to Believe. You know, this is a, an exciting organization where we really uh, look at opening up the gospel for people by revealing God in science. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, science played an important role in my conversion to Christianity. And so I'm you know, utterly convinced that if, that that through science, people can see the reality of God's existence and and uh, be set on a journey to come to know him. So it's a, a fascinating place to work. I've been privileged to be here for 23 years. That is, it sounds very fascinating. And, and I really would want to venture into some of that relationship between science and faith as we move through your story. But let's, let's start at the beginning of your story, though, Fuzz. 
let's start at the beginning of your story. Tell me where you were born, what area of the country, um, were you from the United States, where you grew up, what that was like in terms of your home, and was it a religious home at all? Walk us through that. Sure, sure. Well, um, uh, my father was from India, and uh, he uh, w- lived in India prior to the, the partition taking place, where India won its independence from Great Britain. And uh, when that happened, the states of East and West Pakistan were created. And my father's family were, were Muslims, and so they were forced to immigrate uh, into the state of Pakistan as a result of that. Uh, my father uh, was a nuclear physicist, and so he uh, came to the United States uh, through Canada, where he did a, a PhD in, in nuclear physics. And he worked for a number of years in, in research and development. Uh, this was in the, the ni- late 19, well, 1950s. And of course, being a nuclear physicist in those days was the ticket to have in the sciences. And uh, eventually left um, his work at General Dynamics and took up a, a university position uh, at uh, North Dakota State University. And uh, that's where he met my mother, who came from a Catholic background. Her family are, are Germans. And so uh, she, they agreed to disagree. My, my father was devout as a Muslim. Uh, and usually if a, a, a non-Muslim marries a Muslim, the expectation is a conversion will take place where that person will convert to Islam. Uh, but my father was uh, very devout, but also very progressive and modern in his views of Islam. And so he never expected or asked my mom to convert to Islam. But she was really a, a non, non-practicing Catholic. So as my brother and I were growing up in our household, uh, we were exposed primarily to Islam. But um, my mom's parents were devout Catholics. And so when they would come to visit or we would go visit them, part of that experience was always going to Catholic church. So had a little bit of exposure to Catholicism growing up as well. Uh, I was born in Ames, Iowa in the Midwest, and then um, uh, ended up growing up for the most part in West Virginia. We moved there uh, when I was four. My father took a position at West Virginia Institute of Technology as the chairman of the physics department. And so uh, I can consider myself really um, to be from West Virginia, if you ask me where I'm from. Mm, mm. That's where I'd say from from West Virginia. So, um, uh, yeah, so that was that was a bit about where I'm from and kind of a little bit about my family background. That would be interesting growing up with two very different religious perspectives, one from your mother's side, one from your father's side. And it sounds like there was more active participation perhaps in the more Islamic mm-hmm. part of of your religious upbringing. Was that confusing for you at all in terms of doing something Catholic with one side of the family and, and Muslim on another side? Um, I don't, not, not really. It just was the way it was. Yeah. I mean, it was, that was the way it was from the very beginning. And there was a lot of discussion from my father about Islam in relative to Christianity, you know, where he was, you know, had a rather negative view of the Christian faith for the most part. Uh, he w- would not go to Catholic church, as you might imagine with my, you know, my mother and her family. Uh, but, you know, he, uh, my father, you know, was, you know, very much, uh, was open-minded in many respects, though. I mean, he was, again, very devout, but he wasn't um, dogmatic. He always kind of left it up to my brother and I to really make our own decisions when it came to things involving religion. I and mean, for him, the most important thing were, were our academics, you know, and so he was very, you know, very much, uh, uh, interested in, in, in our, you know, our academic pursuits. That was really what, you know, if there was anything that was non-negotiable in our household, it was, uh, it was you know, not excelling in, in, in academics. Um, my father very much, you know, uh, lived out his faith. Uh, I remember him getting up every morning and he would go through a ritual cleansing and, and then face, uh, pray to Mecca facing the east with a, laying out a prayer carpet uh, you know, he would carry a prayer book with him in his breast pocket everywhere he went. Mm. So he really was very devout as a Muslim. Um, and, uh, you know, again, he never really imposed Islam on my brother and I. But, you know, 
you, you catch things by osmosis many times. And uh, I can remember um, in West Virginia at that time, there weren't mosques anywhere. And so from time to time, we would actually go to prayer meetings that were hosted at a, a friend of his home, you know, who would invite Muslims in the, in the, in the community to come. And, and, and so I would go through a, a through prayer with my father and, and kind of learned a little bit about, quite a bit actually, about Islamic theology. Again, just through casual conversations with my father. But when I was a, a teenager, I became very interested in Islam. And I think part of it was just wanted to connect a little bit with my father. Part of it was really trying to come to grips with my, my heritage, you know. And um, so I, uh, my father taught me how to pray. And I began to read from the Quran. I recited the Shahada, which was the declaration that uh, Allah was the one true God and Muhammad was his one true prophet, and spent probably a good course of uh, a year, a year and a half of, of actually exploring Islam. I can remember uh, telling my friends that I actually identified as a Muslim, which was a, uh, you know, not necessarily um, an easy thing uh, in growing up in West Virginia, which was in the heart of the Bible Belt. So I can remember a few instances where it was actually, you know, uh, treated poorly as a result of that. I, when the this would in in the 1970s, when the Iranian hostage crisis mm. took place, uh, my friends actually, uh, a couple of them actually beat me up a little bit, not real badly, but kind of you know pushed me around a little bit because of that. And uh, I can remember one time um, uh, somebody in the, the locker room, there's all kinds of locker room antics that went on uh, back in those days. Things weren't very well supervised. I could tell you some stories are not necessarily appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> some of the things we did. Uh, but, but I remember one instance, somebody uh, washing my mouth out with soap because of, uh, you know, because I had Allah on my, on my mouth and that type mm -hmm. of thing. So, you know, um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, went through that experience, uh, you know, by, because I identified as a Muslim, uh, you know, in, um, so anyway, but yeah. Would you say during that time, obviously you were identifying as a Muslim, you were reading the Quran, you were going through some ritual prayer. Would you say that, I, I mean, I, it sounds as if you held some kind of a belief in some kind of a higher power, Allah. At that yeah. time, I would imagine. Yeah. I don't ever recall growing up really doubting God's existence, um, at least, you know, as a, as a young man. But, you know, after a, a period of time, um, just kind of became disillusioned with, with Islam. Uh, part of it was, you know, for me, reading the Quran, at least at that point, seemed very, it was just very esoteric. You know, it didn't, you know, make a lot of sense, didn't have a lot of meaning for me, uh, the prayer became burdensome. It was something that, you know, you in Islam, you pray as an obligation, not as a way to, you know, commune with God. It's an obligation. In fact, in Islam, God is unknowable. Mm. So you can't know God in the way that a Christian would, would say that they know and experience God. Uh, and, you know, I remember an instance where um, I was probably a junior, um, the world history teacher that I had, knew that my father was a Muslim and, and asked if he would be willing to come to class and just talk about Islam, you know, just kind of a, and my father refused to do that. He felt like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is just putting a target on my back. And so I, that really had an impact on me because it's like, okay, you, you live a life and, and you are sincerely devout, but you're not willing to actually uh, express your belief. And so if that's the case, is this really true? And that that had an impact on me, and and you know this was about the time when I was getting ready to graduate from high school, you know, and so uh, you know there were other things that were interesting to me too that were competing, right. you know, right. girls, you know, rock music, <laughs> sports, yeah, you know, those types of things, and so sure. you know it, it was a probably a, a combination of things that really just led me to really give up on Islam. Okay. Now, you said that you were in West Virginia, which you characterized as in the Bible Belt. So you were surrounded in some sense by Christians or at least cultural Christianity. What was your experience or, or 
with Christians at that time? Yeah. Um, well, you know, my, both my mother and my father had a fairly negative view of Christianity. And, and of course, growing up in West Virginia, you, you, you saw what was really the, a more fundamentalist expression of Christianity. Mm. You know, there were uh, people that, um, you know, handled snakes that, you know, I, I, uh, that was something that was part of Christianity, at least for some people in West Virginia. And, uh, you know, and the, you had people like uh, faith healers and things like that. And so my parents really saw Christianity as being something that uneducated, unsophisticated people held to. And, and that kind of, you know, had an impression upon me. Uh, and But yet I really, in some respects, uh, envied my friends who were Christians because they were part of this community. You could tell at school that they, they had these friendships with other classmates and that friendship was born out of the fact that they went to church together. They were part of the same youth group together, that they had these experiences together that really knit them. And so I, I felt a little envious and felt a little bit like an outsider. Hmm. You know, like, hey, I just don't have that, that, that real sense of community. But I can remember, you know, in college having friends that were Christians and they would share their faith with me. And I would just think, uh, I, I just don't know how you can believe this type of, these types of things. Um, at that time, I was, you know, taking courses in, in science and chemistry and biology. And, you know, through the courses, particularly that I had in biology, that really, in many respects, fostered a position of agnosticism. You know, I wasn't really sure that God existed because the the grand claim in biology is that everything can be explained through evolutionary mechanisms. And, you know, if, um, you know, uh, if, bio, if biology can be fully accounted through by mechanism, then what role is there for a creator to play? There, a creator becomes superfluous. And, um, and, and many of the professors I had, particularly biology professors, were really, uh, you know, again, teaching biology in the Bible Belt a lot of their students would challenge them on the issue of creation and evolution. And I think they just had it with that. And so they had a very negative perspective on Christianity as well. So uh, I felt very comfortable, you know, calling myself an agnostic. I don't know that I ever would have said I was an atheist per se, um, uh, but, you know, I w was really uncertain about God's existence. So you, I guess, became comfortable in that scientific way of thinking that you associated yourself with those who were intellectually astute that um, evolution could explain the reality of what we're seeing, at least in the biological world, um, in terms of mechanism. Did you, uh, by chance, when you, when you embraced this kind of godless reality, did you consider uh, that naturalistic worldview, or at least I know you were agnostic. So, but did you follow that worldview through beyond, say, biological implications, say, with regard to your life, or even question it in terms of the origin of life, um, not just the mechanism of biology? Yeah, you know, um, I think I probably limited it primarily to the way I thought about things scientifically, um, you know, uh, I, science is such a, an alluring drug, <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's so much fun to to investigate problems and to learn about nature and investigate problems in nature that in and of itself, it becomes an obsession. And, and so that's, you know, as a graduate, uh, undergraduate student, I could, began dreaming about going to graduate school and earning a PhD in biochemistry and really pursuing a career. So all I thought about was, how do I learn as much as I can about the sciences? You know, my, my parents, even though my mom was a non-practicing Catholic, was a very moral person. You know, my father was a very moral person. So I had a very strong moral upbringing. Mm. So, you know, um, you know, I, I don't, wouldn't say that I held to a kind of a, a, a Christian worldview in terms of, of my mor morality and ethics exclusively, but, you know, you know, but I, I was, would have considered myself to be a fairly moral person. 
you know, understood that there was right and wrong, but I just never thought about mm. things more deeply from a religious perspective than that, uh, you know. So as you were moving along in your, in your academics and pursuing science, and it sounds like you were very engrossed in that world, did it just confirm more and more kind of an anti-God sentiment in terms of your understanding of the world and reality? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, by the time I, I went to graduate school, I was, you know, um, had no interest in, in the God question whatsoever. I mean, to me, it was science is, go- is, the, is the answer to, to our problems as human beings. And that mm. as a scientist, I could participate in not only uncovering the secrets of nature, but doing things that would dramatically impact people's lives. Well, it sounds like that actually gave you a lot of meaning and purpose and and ambition in a sense. Um, yeah. As you were as you were moving along and studying, really at high, very elite levels of academia and pursuing these questions, was there anything that that caused you to sit back and think this is hard to explain from a purely naturalistic perspective? Yeah, it was really uh, in graduate school, in, in the first year of graduate school, where that that question kind of surfaced. And, you know, as I was learning about biochemical systems, it was just so much fun to be a graduate student because I was surrounded by pr- professors. I was, a, I was in a smaller, uh, you know, chemistry department. So I had access to almost all the faculty. And so it was just a lot of fun to to, to talk with the the different faculty to get their perspective on things, to learn about their research, to engage other graduate students, you know, to take advanced coursework. I started reading the scientific literature, all this, you know, began to do my own research. And, you know, in that environment, it was just, you know, again, just absolutely thrilling. But what was, you know, what was remarkable is how all of us just marveled at the nature of biochemical systems. It was not unusual for all of us to say, look at how amazing this is. Look at how cool this is. I can't believe it works this way. There's just an elegance and an ingenuity mm. to, to biochemical systems. And I began to wonder, gosh, how on earth do we ex- account for the origin of these systems? Right. And I knew from an undergraduate, that was the origin of life question. Right. And, uh, and so I, you know, and now I'm a graduate student. It's like, okay, I got the wherewithal to really dig into this you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to, you know, on the, on my own time, study the original life problem. It wasn't really required in our coursework. And, and, uh, you know, through that investigation very quickly came to the recognition that these, these processes that people are speculating could generate biochemical systems seem woefully inadequate to me. Mm. It just doesn't seem like chemistry and physics could produce these kinds of systems. Uh, because, you know, I, I, you know, had enough experience as a chemist, you know, to know how hard it is to get chemicals to do what you want them to do under carefully controlled conditions in a laboratory setting, to think that somehow, you know, molecules that are far more complex than anything that a chemist could ever dream of producing in the lab could just simply emerge through chemical evolution just seemed to me to be far-fetched. And so, it was at that point that I, I reached the conclusion there has to be a mind behind everything, that at least when it comes to the origin of life and the, and the origin of biochemical systems, there had to be a, a higher intelligence that, that brought those systems into existence. You know, now, once those systems were in existence, I reasoned at that point that evolutionary processes could have explained the history of life. But to me, at least with respect to the origin of life, there had to be some kind of creator Uh, that was responsible. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about a tremendous upcoming event sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Institute, which addresses some of the most confusing questions of our time. Is it possible to be a scientist and a person of faith at the same time? Are Christianity and science really at odds with one another? We often hear from skeptics that science and faith are more foes than friends. But is that really true? Renowned scientist and philosopher Dr. John Lennox will be addressing these important questions on a virtual event called Cosmic Chemistry. If you're looking for a way to understand and explain how science and faith go together, 
This is a must watch interview. This important online event with Dr. Lennox will be held on the evening of October 21st at 8 p.m. There is no charge for this event, but you do need to register at the C.S. Lewis Institute website. That's cslewisinstitute.org and click events. Now, back to our story. At that point, did you, in terms of who or what that creator or that mind was, um, did you do any further investigation in terms of trying to identify more who or what that transcendent source was? Or did you just kind of accept that and then move forward? Well, I mean, one for me, at least, when I re- realized that there was a creator, then the question became, who is that creator and how do I relate to that creator? And became very, very interested in that question. I didn't really have the tools to properly engage that question. I had no training theologically or philosophically of, of any sorts. And so I began just on my own to reason through who could this creator be. And so I began going down a path of universalism where I thought, well, maybe this creator revealed himself to the different people of the world in different ways and that the different religious systems of the world really represent this creator reaching out to people. And, you know, when you look at the moral teachings of the world's religions, there's quite a bit of common ground. I was, again, theologically and philosophically naive because the different religions of the world teach very different things about the nature of reality and the nature of God and the the nature of the person of Christ. Uh, But at that point in time, I just didn't have the sophistication to appreciate that. But also, I I think part of my my exposure to Islam played a role as well, because in Islam, you know, Muhammad is considered the seal of the prophets. But, you know, Muslims view you know, Adam and, and Noah and Abraham and David, you know, and Moses and Jesus as being prophets to particular people at particular times. And so there's a, a type of universality to Islam. There's a type of religious pluralism embedded in Islamic theology. And, and so I'm sure that some of that was in, in influencing the way I thought about things. I also saw, you know, really Islam and I was exposed to Catholicism and so here are two expressions of, of religions that I saw growing up. And so, you know, who's this, who has to necessarily choose one or the other? Why couldn't they all be true? Mm. Right. So I was going down that particular path. Uh, and uh, what really changed, you know, my, the, my way of thinking was, uh, you know, my, my wife to be. Uh, conversion, my fiance's conversion to Christianity. She, she grew up in a Christian home and, um, uh, you know, she dedicated her life to Christ as a, as a teenager and then kind of drifted away from her faith. And then um, her, her mom had a friend who was going to a small Pentecostal church in downtown Charleston, West Virginia, and invited um, Amy's mother to go to church, and she really liked that experience. And so they both invited Amy to go to church on Easter, and Amy went and rededicated her life to Christ. And so she began to share her faith with me. And what did you think of that? I mean, I guess at that point you were somewhat open to the possibility of God or a personal God, uh, perhaps yeah, a well, Christian God. Yeah, you know, I think that. I, I remember when Amy told me that she had become a Christian or rededicated her life to Christ. I, I remember saying, hey, this is wonderful if that's what you want to do. I just don't think I can be a Christian because I'm a scientist. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where I got that mindset from other than probably just the the experiences I had growing up and the way I saw Christianity expressed. But, you know, I, I felt like I was being very generous because I saw the example of my parents Right. And so I thought, look, if this is something you want to do, I'm I'm fully supportive. It's just not it's just not for me, you know, and um, she had a a bit of a bit of a crisis. I, um, you know, she um, was again at this small church and was really just growing enormously as a a Christian and was at a Bible study where the question, the the topic of being unequally yoked with a a nonbeliever came up. 
And I, we, we later learned that, that her pastor, uh, Johnny Withrow, deliberately uh, was teaching on that uh, lesson, but he was actually directing the lesson towards somebody else, not towards Amy. Oh, but okay. she's the one that actually took that message to heart. And so she was like, what, what do I do? You know? And, and so I became the prayer project for this church and we were, you know, <laughs> we were going to be married in, 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 you know, in a couple of months, you know, and we had the date for our wedding set. And she was like, what do I, you know, she, what do I do? And so the whole church was praying for us. And I remember Amy said, you know, telling me, um, you know, well, Johnny wants to meet with you because we want to talk about, you know, about the wedding you know, plans. And I can remember saying something, you know, really idiotic, <laughs> like, you all, you know, whatever you guys decide to do for the wedding, I'm fine with just tell me when to show up. Right, right. You know, so, you know, knowing being married now for 35 years, I know <laughs> just how moronic that was. But, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> anyway, uh, my poor, my poor wife, yeah, but what she's gone through, but um, anyway, uh, but so she insisted and I thought, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll meet with Johnny. And I was just bracing myself for the sales pitch. I knew what was coming. And so, you know, to, to Johnny's credit, what he did is he basically challenged me in saying, have you ever read the Bible? And apart from reading Genesis one, I never read the Bible. And he says, well, how did, how do you know it's not true? And I thought, you know, you, you really have a point here. And and he, you know, really appealed to my pride as a scientist, saying, "Look, if if you're a scientist, you should be open to investigating truth claims, no matter where they come from." And so I thought, well, you know, my wife to be is a Christian. Johnny's making a good point. So I got a copy of of the Bible, uh, and I would sit in the chemistry lab after I finished my day, my work for the day, when everybody else had gone home, and. And I didn't want anybody to see me reading the Bible. And I'd sit at the lab bench and I'd start reading through the Bible. And I can remember complaining to Amy. It's like, I, I just don't really know where to start. And it's, you know, I'm having some trouble here. And she said, well, start uh, with the gospel of John. And I ended up not understanding exactly what she meant. So I started with the gospel of Matthew. Okay. And, and what would, was intriguing to me is like, oh, this is where the Christmas story comes from. You know, growing up, you know, in a non-Christian home and seeing, the, being exposed to the Christmas story, it's like, oh, this is intriguing. So now I understand where the story comes from. And then um, I remember reading the Sermon on the Mount, and that was an, an incredibly powerful passage of scripture for me at that time. And it still is, because here I'm ex introduced to the person of Christ and his teachings. And I realized that this is the way that I want to live, that what Christ is teaching here is true. I found the person of Christ very winsome. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, I was being condemned by what Christ was teaching. And I had this desire to please Jesus. That was really odd to me. And along the way, one of Johnny's friends gave me a little booklet on how to become a Christian. And so I realized that there was no way I could live up to the standards of Christ uh, but I wanted to, and 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 I wouldn't have had the words for it at that time. But I was really confronted with my sin, and so there's this little booklet on, you know, how do you become a Christian that kind of took me through the gospel, and I you know, through that going through that book, I prayed to receive Christ. But through the process of really at that evening, I remember reading the again the Sermon on the Mount. I had this, I would call it a religious experience, where it felt like there was a person in the room with me while I was, you know, really contemplating what the Sermon on the Mount meant. And I had this overwhelming sense that this was true. And I've never had an experience like that before and never had an experience like that afterwards. And so I would just say that it was an encounter that I had with the, with the resurrected Christ, wow. uh, you know, that, um, that was part of that, that process of, you know, really drawing me, uh, to, you know, towards Jesus. But, you know, the, the, the stage was set, right. You know, with, with seeing God revealed in science and then really, I'm sure the prayers of, of people that were, were praying, you know, um, on, on my behalf, you know, right. you know, I, I found out later that my wife was, uh, was going to, if I didn't convert, was going to call off the wedding. She was 
really that convinced, but she never said that to me. It was just, this was her personal conviction. And so uh, God, God was, God faithfully honored her prayers, you know, um, so, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, there are a few things that, that stand out there to me um, that beg a few questions, especially knowing um, your intellect, your your dedication as a scientist, um, your former reading of the Quran is a f- form of holy text. And then looking at the Bible, I'm sure there are a lot of differences there. But the first thing I want to ask in a sense, is when you open the Bible for the first time, of course, you'd had some kind of esoteric reference there with the Quran and that the Bible or the biblical narrative in Matthew, I'm sure, felt quite different as a a story, but also embedded in those stories are supernatural, you know, presumptions and actions and activities. And I know at this point, it sounds like you were open to perhaps the person of God, whoever that was. So when you read the scripture for the first time, did you push back on what seemed to be the miraculous or did that seem to seem like it's fitting and all the pieces are fitting into place? It makes sense to me if a supernatural being exists, the the miraculous can happen. Yeah, I don't think I was ever troubled with the, the presentation of the miraculous I mean, I'm in, in some respects, I expected that to be the case, right? That, that if indeed there really is a creator, that, that there, that there was room for miracles. And, uh, and, you know, and, you know, one of the things that really struck me immediately reading the Bible, as you alluded to, Jana, compared to the Quran is, is that it was written as if Here's a narrative. This it was written as if this was history, as if this really happened. That it was it was you could follow. The, there was a, a logic. There was a an, an ordering to to what was being presented that that made sense. That that was that I could track with. That I could understand. Right. You know. And you know. Even to the the culmination of Christ's teaching at the Sermon on the Mount is part of the uh, the narrative right it's the teaching is incorporated into the narrative and so i i felt like i was you know uh part of a story right and and i understood what was going on i understood what was being uh, communicated uh which was not the case when i was reading from the quran Mm. and uh, another thought that that occurred to me is that you you open the Bible as a curious investigator, as an honest scientist would do, right? You're willing to open and look at the evidence and see where the evidence leads. And it led you to the truth in the person of Christ, which I agree is he can be an amazingly compelling character, especially when you're not expecting what you find in scripture. Um, I can also hear a skeptic whispering in my ear saying, well, how much investigation did he really do? He opened the Bible. He had a, a, an experience of Christ. He, he was overwhelmed by the teaching and the person of Christ, which sometimes is enough. I mean, if that's a real experience, it's not, I think, in a sense that you're just not looking for truth, which it is, but also the reality. And Jesus showing up in a, in a very palpable way, I'm sure was incredibly convincing for you evidentiary almost in a sense that his presence was enough to convince you in a sense um, all of those things put together so i wonder how you would answer the skeptic to say well you didn't investigate for for very long um i mean i, I guess i would say yes and no to to that question you know in terms of how long did i investigate um in in, in, in to, to respond to the skeptic, um, gosh, I think it was in the summer of 1999, Michael Shermer, uh, who heads up the Skeptic Society uh, located in Pasadena, California, wrote a book on uh, how we believe, I think is the title of the book. And he and a, a sociologist by the name of Frank Soloway uh, interviewed people and asked them why they believe. And the, num- the, the two reasons were, number one, uh, seeing design in 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 nature, mm. and number two reason was experiencing God, mm. and so I would say that my you know conversion essentially involved you know 
both of those, you know, both of those facets where, you know, I did see, I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't looking for a crutch. You know, I discovered God in the design of biochemical systems. And, and so the question was really who, who was God? Mm. And to me, the encounter I had with Christ really drove home who God is, you know, in it. And so Jesus is indeed, you know, God incarnate. So it was that, ex that experience. But I think experiencing God is as much evidential as actually seeing, you know, uh, the, you know, the elegant structure of a biochemical system or a biomolecule. Uh, and the thing is, is that as a scientist, you know, you have a theory, you, uh, you know, you have data that seems to support the theory. Your work isn't done. You continue to, to devise experiments and observations to, to interrogate that theory, to determine whether that theory uh, continues to withstand ongoing scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And so for the 35 years I've been a Christian, I've continued to challenge you know, my conversion, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, I continue to study biochemistry and, and see even more and more evidence for design. In fact, have worked hard to develop design arguments based on the latest advances in biochemistry as a way to formalize that intuition of design that I had. I could continue to study the origin of life question and seeing more and more intractable problems emerge, you know, over the, the 35 years that I've been investigating. Uh, you know, I have since then, you know, learned about the historical argument for the life, death and resurrection of Christ, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the arguments that are made for the reliability of the Old and the New Testaments, you know, uh, I've learned about archaeological evidence that supports both the Old and the New Testaments, and even have uh, studied things like the argument from religious experience for God's existence. Richard Swinburne is somebody, mm -hmm. philosopher at, I think, Oxford that developed this argument, you know, uh, and so there, so you can even take religious experience and actually, by looking at the shared experience that Christians have had for 2,000 years, construct an argument uh, for, for God's existence. And so I've continued to, to challenge my conversion in a sense, you know, and, and am more convinced now than ever. And so the investigation continued and still continues to this very day, you know, where I'm, I, you know, am not afraid to, to look at challenges from skeptics that would challenge God's existence or challenge, you know, um, the God of the Bible as being the explanation for who the creator is. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really excellent answer. I think it's an honest answer. Um, again, as someone who takes objective truth seriously, who is, is constantly testing hypotheses, right. And, and coming to conclusions based upon what you observe and, and see. Um, I am, also encouraged in a sense that you look not only at the biological mechanisms uh, your field of expertise but you're willing to look at reality in a grand way in a sense and look at the whole picture um, with regard to reality it sounds as if the more that you have studied the more that you can see how science and belief in god really coalesce, that they're not enemies. You kind of had the presumption early in your life that you can't study science or be a scientist and, and have faith in God or believe in God. Um, how would you answer that skeptic? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting about Christianity is that uh, God invites us to, to test, <laughs> you know, to test our faith, right? Um, and, you know, there's this idea that somehow faith is just blind belief in, in what you hope to be true. But from a biblical perspective, faith is really about uh, looking at evidence and then acting on the evidence that's in front of you. And, and so, you know, the when you look at the stories in Scripture, uh, people are experiencing God and then are being asked as a result of that experience 
you know, to then uh, to then put faith in God. And ultimately, you know, that's what Jesus is asking us when, with respect to faith. It's that here is everything about me, <laughs> right? And now do you trust in me as the, the way for your salvation? So faith is not something that we blindly hope is true, but it really is something that has an evidential component to it. But yet at some point we have to exercise the act of trust, you know, in, in light of what the evidence is telling us. And, and in, in some respects, that's true about science is that we're using evidence to evaluate theoretical ideas, but we also are making certain assumptions about the nature of reality as we gather that evidence and then draw conclusions from it. But then once you have a theory in place, you are then acting on faith to, to determine if that theory is indeed valid. And, you know, so you make predictions about what you think will be, you know, discovered in the future. And, and then you, you know, operate accordingly or, you know, so there's a, a faith element in the same way in science as you do see in, in, I think, in the Christian faith. But the scripture also tells us too that, you know, God is revealed to us through the record of nature. And not only can we see evidence for God's fingerprints according to scripture, but even ascertain God's character. And so, um, you know, you would expect then if, if science is really about investigating the world of nature, that science should actually uncover pointers to God, should reveal to us, you know, about the reality of God. When you look at the creation accounts in scripture, many of them are presented as a divine natural history. And so there are elements of that that are also testable as well. Uh, and so, you know, this idea of testing is really very much part of the Christian faith. And um, and scripture kind of invites you to, it, it, it presents things in ways that invite predictions and invite testing. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about our new Side B Stories website. Perhaps you or someone you know is questioning whether or not belief in God is even possible or credible, whether or not Christianity is worthy of belief. The trouble is, in our culture today, Christianity is viewed largely as a belief system for the weak, delusional, and uneducated. It can be extremely difficult to break through the negativity and stereotypes to explore authentic, historic Christianity. If you're a skeptic or atheist, what would it take for you to consider the reality of God or the truth of Christianity? Or if you're a Christian, how can you better understand or engage with skeptics in a meaningful way? Our new Side B Stories website was created with you in mind. In addition to housing our podcast stories, it also features short video testimonies from former atheists and resources they have recommended or written about their own journeys to believe. And you'll hear their advice to skeptics on how to pursue a search for God and advice to Christians on how to engage with those who don't believe. We offer these stories from former skeptics on the Side B Stories website because there is no bigger question that affects your life than whether or not God is real or true, good or relevant, in a culture where Christianity is sometimes viewed unworthy of belief. Side B Stories shows what it did and does take for skeptics to become believers. You can find all of this by going to our new website, sidebstories.com. We hope you'll take a look and share this wonderful resource with skeptics and Christians alike. Now back to our story. I think that's a really um, helpful way for us to think about things as Christians. I think there is sometimes a, a presumption that you just believe and and that you don't you know need to continue to affirm and the person of God through a scientific investigation or testing or whether it's looking at the biblical text or looking at the archaeological record or all these many things that you do to, to look at scripture and hold things up and test them and hold on to the things that are good. But also what I love about it is that you're not afraid to question, right? So that you're continually led more closely to truth, whatever that is. And it, it seems to me that after 35 years, 
um, you hold a pretty solid uh, belief uh, that, that what you believe in terms of God and Christianity is true. And that's so encouraging. And I'm sure Amy was incredibly ex- excited when you came to faith in Christ and, and that the wedding could proceed and that, that you actually have a household of unity in terms of your, your religious belief and your faith and, and what you pass on to your children. Yeah, you know, my wife always says, you know, um, the way our stories intersected is really a testament to God's faithfulness, right? And and um, and I I would agree with that. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's just so many in in retrospect. There's just so many, you know, pointers to, um, you know, in, in signposts that I see where God was at work. You know, in retrospect, even you know, having a friend in college who was a, a Christian father was a Methodist minister, and he and I having uh, conversations about, you know, how do we make sense of Genesis one in light of modern science? And he and I having, you know, those kind of conversations and uh, asking questions: Was Jesus hip haploid or diploid? <laughs> Things like that. Some of the, but those were all conversations that were placing, you know, but were putting stepping stones in front of me, you know, uh, along the way. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful how you can look back and actually see God's hand in your life, um, even when you you really didn't know what it was at the time, but yeah. you can recognize it in in hindsight. That that's really amazing. Before we go on to the advice that I'm going to ask of you uh, for skeptics and Christians, is there anything else that, to add to your story to, that you think that we've missed, or anything you'd like to to include? Uh, no, uh, other than, you know, um, I guess to me as a scientist, you know, the, there's nothing more uh, gratifying than learning how something works, you know, in nature and, you know, and just seeing, again, God's fingerprints in that process. I, I see myself as a scientist as much as a, a worship leader as anything else where, you know, I get to see you know, God revealed in nature in, in ways that, you know, I think the, the a lay person wouldn't necessarily see. But then, you know, trying to communicate that to lay people is a lot of fun. And you know, it's exciting when pe- lay people get a glimpse of just the, the majesty of the creator through through what he's made. You know, it's 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 very exciting. And so I just see myself as as much as a, a worship leader as anything else, as a scientist and a person of faith. Mm, that that's beautiful. Yeah, the heavens do declare the glory of His handiwork, and uh, you know it it is kind of interesting to me how even the most atheist among us, like Richard Dawkins or even Lawrence Krauss, who will declare the, the the magic or the wonder, you know, of the cosmos or the things that they're observing, they just have no place to put it. Um, but as a as a Christian, you know, you you can look at the wonder and the complexity and the beauty and the elegance. I think it's the word that you used of what you see in the cell, and just go, well, there's a reason for that. You know, <laughs> there was a mind and and. Uh, and it all makes sense. The pieces come together because it is a comprehensive and true worldview. Um, that's really, really wonderful, I'm sure. Before we get to the advice, I do want our listeners to know a little bit of the writing that you've done. Could you just mention very briefly about some of the books that you've written so they have a sense of, of your scope of uh, sure. uh, expertise? Yeah, well... Um... I've written four books dealing with the, the origin of life question and the design of biochemical systems. So one book is cleverly titled Origins of Life. <laughs> one is uh, uh, The Cell's Design, where I look at um, the, the nature of biochemical systems and present kind of a revitalized watchmaker argument for God's existence. Uh, I've got a book called Creating Life in the Lab, which was a lot of fun to work on, and it's about the work uh, in synthetic biology where scientists are literally trying to create cells uh, in the lab Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of presenting an argument that I'd call an empirical argument for God's existence, basically showing how uh, intelligent agency is critical uh, in order to 
convert molecules into the into cell like entities and and if that's the case then by analogy that should be true when it comes to the origin of life and just have a book released uh, about a, a year ago now uh, called fit for a purpose uh, which is uh, presenting another type of design argument from biochemistry then I've also very much interested in the question of human origins you know to me I think in the science faith conversation there's no area that is of more as more implications than really how we understand our origins as human beings. And, and so I've got a, a book called Who Was Adam that I wrote looking at the scientific evidence in dealing in, with human origins and how to integrate that with the biblical account of human origins, where we show that there's really a strong scientific case that can be made that human beings bear God's image, you know, as scripture describes. And then also interested in kind of the, the, the future of science and technology. So I wrote a book called Humans 2.0 that deals with the idea of using technology to modify our biological makeup uh, and, and to try to create post-human species where many people view human beings now as being in control of evolution. And so I look at the, the advances that are happening in, in transhumanism and uh, really uh, discuss what does it mean from a Christian worldview perspective for transhumanism to be gaining momentum and how do how does the gospel intersect with transhumanist thinking and i'm currently working on a book called should we play god which would be kind of a sequel to humans 2.0 as well as a sequel to uh, creating life in the lab and it's looking at advances in in synthetic biology and our ability to create artificial organisms uh you know in a laboratory and uh, how should we think about that from a Christian perspective where I'm developing a theology for synthetic biology and biotechnology uh, using kind of the grand narrative of Christianity, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation as being mm. the framework. And how do these different areas of Christian theology speak to our efforts to create artificial life forms? And, and um, you know, uh, how can we con produce a, a robust theology that gives us a framework to think about these kind of advances and in really addressing the question, should we play God? So uh, that's a great anyway. question. Yeah. And wow, thank you for for that little summary. It sounds jam packed with fascinating, fascinating work. I hope our listeners will take advantage of start to read some of your resources if they haven't already. Um, as we're wrapping up, Fuzz, and thinking about those who are perhaps skeptics, maybe they're open, you know, perhaps they're agnostic, but open to the possibility of God or a mind or something that's bigger than themselves, bigger than mechanical systems. Um, how would you advise someone like that to consider in a, you know, in a serious way, the possibility of God? Yeah, I, I guess I would ask the question, how open-minded are you uh, to the reality of God's existence? And, um, you know, because, you know, we from astronomy, we, we've got this recognition that the universe has a beginning, that there's design in the, the universe. This is the fine-tuning of the fundamental constants. We see design in biology. The origin of life is, is you know, a scientific mystery. We don't really know how life originates. And so these are, you know, nobody disputes there's design in the universe, there's design in biology. Nobody disputes that when it comes to the question of origins, there seems to be something that that is beyond our capacity to explain the universe or explain life. Uh, and what, in my experience, many skeptics will look to any kind of potential natural process explanation and would will prefer that compared to, I think, the obvious possibility that there is a, a God that's behind everything. And so really my question is how open-minded are you to what the evidence is really saying? Are you truly open-minded or would you prefer a natural process explanation? Uh, you know, uh, and, and if that's the case, why? Why is that the case? Why do you prefer that explanation? Uh, so that would, th those would really be the questions I would have. But I, I think if one is really open-minded Again, I, the, the evidence really points strongly, you know, in the in the direction of, of Christian theism. And 
you know, yet there are still outstanding problems. You know, the problem of evil, right? The 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 the, the what's now being called the hiddenness of God problem. You know, and these are challenges and problems that Christians and non-believers alike wrestle with, right? Um, and 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 I wouldn't minimize the severity or the significance of those problems, but there's ultimately, you know, answers. There's intellectual answers to those problems, but you know, ultimately, the most satisfying answer to these challenges is actually the person of Christ, right? It's only through the person of Christ can you make any kind of sense or have any kind of meaning in suffering. It's only in the person of Christ that you find hope in the midst of suffering. And it's in the person of Christ that you realize that God isn't hidden from us, though we might think that to be the case. God isn't hidden from us, but is fully revealed to us. And so to me, even the most significant challenges to Christian theism, or at least what many people think are significant challenges, really are, in a sense, taking us to the very heart of the gospel itself. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the, the only satisfying explanation to those two challenges is, is the person of Christ, ultimately. So mm-hmm. um, e- even when the, superficially the evidence seems to go against Christianity, when you think more deeply about it, it, it really brings to lo- to life the gospel itself. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, when people, you'll often hear people say, well, there's no evidence for God. I guess that particular statement, I would imagine, would be, would answer your first question, how open are you, really? Um, and then, and then it's, I guess trying to peel back the onions of, you know, why are you so closed off? But that that's a that's another issue probably for another day, because yeah. um, that that can be very difficult. Uh, but that is that is very wise. I love the way that you pulled all of that together. And for the Christian um, who wants to engage with someone who is very skeptical, uh, but perhaps open. How would you best encourage Christians to, you know, share the gospel or provide evidence or how would you suggest that they go about that? You know, I I think the the first thing that we have to do is recognize that regardless of a person's worldview and whether their worldview is something that we would share, we have to recognize that they are image bearers. And that they are have infinite worth and value, that they are sacred, and that our greatest obligation towards those people is to love them, right? And if we we have to, anything we do as we engage non-believers has to be ultimately shaped by our genuine love for them. If we can't say that we genuinely love that person, we probably shouldn't try to present the gospel to them. But when people know that you genuinely love them and that you accept them, uh, regardless of, of their perspective, that goes a long ways, I think, towards really building genuine bridges with other people, and and then to on, have honest conversations with them, you know, about their doubts, not to judge them, not to necessarily pepper them with evidence, but really answer and engage their questions mm-hmm. and engage them sincerely, um, you know, and. And, you know, be aware of what kind of resources are available that you can point people to, you know, who who do have questions if you yourself aren't versed in those questions. But, you know, ultimately, I don't think you can ever argue somebody into the kingdom of God. Uh, but I think you can love people. And through that love, they can they'll experience the love of Christ. And that will, I think, open them up to to evidences and soften their heart towards evidences if that's what they need. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we can hear that enough. I mean, if the person of Christ is the personification of love, you know, and we are his representatives, it is something that we should be able to do well, right? They'll know that we're Christians by our love. And I, I, I do appreciate you reminding us of that because I think sometimes, especially we get, um, carried away with all, all of the intellect and the rationality and the, and the evidences of it, but sometimes we miss the most important thing. Um, 
and, and that is seeing others as image bearers, as you say, and made in the image of God, lo God's love by God's love. And we, and we want to love in the way that he's called us to. So thank you for that reminder. Fez, this has been an amazing um, time together. I just feel like I've learned so much and am in very inspired by your story. I do appreciate you coming on today. And um, as just a representative of someone who is who's not only brilliant, but obviously you have a heart for the Lord and for others. So thank you for showing that to us today and sharing your story. I'm, I'm glad to do it. Thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege to, to be with you. Wonderful. Thanks for tuning in to Side B Stories to hear Dr. Fuzz Rana's story. You can hear more about his speaking and all of the wonderful books he mentioned, as well as the ministry of Reasons to Believe in the episode notes. For questions and feedback about this podcast, you can always contact me through our Side B Stories website at sidebstories.com. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll follow, rate, review, and share our podcast with your friends and social network. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time, where we'll see how another skeptic flips the record of their life.